Preface of the Book of the Dead. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick Seville. The Book of the Dead by E. A. Wallace Budge. To Sir Edward Maud Thompson, K.C.B., D.C.L., L.L.D., Principal Librarian of the British Museum. Dear Sir Edward, With great pleasure I avail myself of the opportunity of inscribing your name at the head of this work on the Theban recession of the Book of the Dead, for you have taken no ordinary interest in its inception and progress and completion. I do it the more gladly, because I know that everything which concerns the religious beliefs of the ancient Egyptians and the wonderful doctrine of the resurrection of the spiritual body and of its everlasting existence, which they evolved thousands of years before our era, has the greatest attraction for you. It is now many years ago since your friendship with our common friend, the late Professor W. Wright, began, and your helpful sympathy with his various Oriental works was never wanting. The like friendship and the like sympathy you have extended to myself, his pupil. For both I thank you, and I subscribe myself. Gratefully yours, E. A. Wallace Budge, London, July 27, 1897. Preface The present volume forms part of a work on the Theban recession of the Book of the Dead, which I have prepared for Messrs. Keegan Paul and Company, with a view of supplying an edition of the Egyptian text in hieroglyphic, a full vocabulary to the same with copious references, and a complete translation with introductory chapters upon the history, object, and contents of the Book of the Dead, in a handy form and at a moderate price. It is the most complete edition of the Theban recession hitherto published, but further discoveries in Egypt may at any moment result in the recovery of papyri containing chapters at present unknown to us. The texts of the Heliopolitan recession of the Book of the Dead of the fifth and sixth dynasties, which are inscribed upon the pyramids of Eunice, Teta, Pepi I, Meren Ra, and Pepi II, and which may be regarded as the most ancient form of the work now known to us, have been published, together with French translations of them by M. Maspero in the various volumes of Recuit de Travaux, and separately under the title of Les Inscriptions de la Pyramide de Saqqara, Paris, 1894. The texts of the recession in use during the eleventh and twelfth dynasties, which are found inscribed upon the coffins of the period, have been published by Lapsius and Maspero, and an excellent idea of their contents may be gained from Birch's translation of the texts on the coffin of Amamu, published with a complete facsimile by the trustees of the British Museum under the title Egyptian Texts of the Earliest Period from the Coffin of Amamu, London, 1886. The texts of the Theban recession, which was in use from the 18th to the 22nd dynasty, for example, from about B.C. 1600 to B.C. 900, and which is found inscribed on several papyri, both plain and illuminated, have been published by Birch, Mariette, Lehman, Deveria, and others, and an eclectic edition of the recession in use from the 18th to the 20th dynasty was published with variants and Ain Lintong by M. Naville in 1886. Translations of single papyri belonging to this period have been published by Deveria and Pierre, Guillet, Lefabre, Massé, Pliette, and others, and certain chapters of this recension have been translated and discussed by various Egyptologists. Texts, both hieratic and hieroglyphic, which were copied and illustrated for the priests and the priestesses of Amun, during the 21st and 22nd dynasties, have been published by Birch, Lehman, Thepsius, Mariette, and Maspero, and a fine example of the heretic manuscript of the period following, entitled Rituel Funiel, was published by E. de Rouge in 1861. Of the texts which represent the Sayet recession of the Book of the Dead, several manuscripts have been printed and described. The most important of these, however, is the famous papyrus preserved at Turin, of which Lepsius published a good copy as far back as 1842, entitled 
da Totenbach der Egypter. The Book of the Dead, which was in use throughout the Greco-Roman and Roman periods, is well illustrated by the heretic texts published and transcribed by Birch in the Proceedings of the Society of Biblical Archaeology, Volume 7, page 49, and by Liblian in his Le Livre Egyptri Cou Mon Nof Leipzig, 1895. The first to publish a complete translation of any recession of the Book of the Dead was Birch, who in 1867 gave an English version of the Turin Papyrus in the fifth volume of Bunsen, Egypt's Place and Universal History, pages 123 through 333. Notwithstanding the fact that the recession here translated is the Sayet, or latest of all, and that the text of the Turin manuscript is faulty in many places, Birch's rendering gave a new impulse to the study of the Egyptian religion, and it has formed the groundwork of the translations made by Egyptologists subsequently. The thing to wonder at is not the mistakes which he made, but that he was able, at that early date, to translate so much correctly. In 1882, Pierret published a French translation of the Turin Papyrus, entitled De Livre des Morts des Asiens Egyptiens, and in 1894, Davis published an English version of Pierre's French translation at New York. Up to the present, however, no complete translation of the Theban recession has appeared. Translations of single papyri, for example, the papyrus of Nebseni, the papyrus of Ani, the papyrus of Sutemis, the papyrus of Nebked, etc., have been made by Deveria and Pire, Guillace, Massé, myself, and others and a translation of the text published by Neville in his Totenbach, and by others, was begun by Renouf in the Proceedings of the Society of Biblical Archaeology, Volume 14. Since the appearance of Neville's great work in 1886, several extremely important papyri have been discovered, and it is now possible to add to the texts of the Theban recession, which he published a considerable number of chapters, etc., from the papyrus of Ani, we obtained instructions to chapters 18 and 125, a hymn to Ra, a hymn to Osiris, texts referring to the judgment scene, all of which are new. Besides these, we gained from it a complete, though short, version of chapter 175, and the vignettes are colored with a care and beauty hitherto unknown in papyri of this class. Of greater interest textually, however, is the papyrus of New, which the trustees of the British Museum acquired in 1890. It is, I believe, the oldest of illuminated papyri known, and it certainly was written in the first half of the period of the rule of the kings of the 18th dynasty. It is nearly, if not quite, as old as the famous papyrus of Nepseni. Unlike many of the papyri of that date, it was written throughout by one man, probably New himself. As in all papyri, lines are omitted here and there, and in one short chapter is repeated. In it, however, are about twenty chapters of the Theban recession, which have not hitherto been found, and several which have, up to the present, been only known to exist in single manuscripts. From the above facts, it is clear that an edition of the text of the Theban recession, which should contain all such new chapters, etc., was needed. When a few years ago, Sir E. Mond Thompson suggested to me to make a translation of the Book of the Dead for popular use, I decided to do so, and to publish at the same time an edition of the Egyptian texts. For in these days, the reader insists, and rightly, upon the reproduction of the original documents as far as possible, so that he may be able to control the rendering set forth by the translator. Since no papyrus contains all the chapters of the Theban recession, and no two papyri agree either in respect of contents or arrangement of the chapters, and the critical value of every text in a papyrus is not always the same, it follows that a complete edition of all the known chapters of the Theban recession is impossible unless recourse be had to several papyri. I have, therefore, made use of several and as a result, translations of about 160 chapters, not including different versions, hymns, and rubrics, are given 
in the present volume. I have also added translations of sixteen chapters of the Sate Recession, both because they form good specimens of the religious compositions of the latter period and illustrate some curious beliefs, and because, having adapted the numbering of the chapters employed by Lepsius, they were needed to make the numbering of the chapters in this edition consecutive. My translation has been made as literal as possible, my aim being to let the reader judge for himself the contents of the Theban Book of the Dead, as it is intended for popular use. I have not encumbered the pages with voluminous notes, nor have I attempted to explain the allusions and obscurities which no man at present understands. For references to the works of other writers, the reader is referred to the bibliography at the end of my papyrus of Ani in the British Museum, London, 1895, and to the notes in the introduction to that work. The source of each chapter is set forth clearly above it, together with a description of the vignette to it as it is found in the best papyri of the 18th and 19th dynasties. Since the vignettes formed originally no part of the Book of the Dead, no attempt has been made to reproduce them here. A collection of all the vignettes found in the Theban papyri, especially those which are found in the Books of the Dead, made for the priests of Almon after B.C. 1000, would be of great value, but, unless they were reproduced in their actual colors, much of their interest would be lost. The whole judgment scene and the Elysian fields and a portion of the vignette to the first chapter have, however, been beautifully reproduced in full colors by Mr. W. Griggs from the Papyrus of Ani, and these form excellent examples of the artistic work executed upon papyri in the 18th dynasty. Those who require other examples are referred to the second edition of the colored facsimile of the Papyrus of Ani, published by the trustees of the British Museum in 1894. In the introduction, a sketch of the history of the growth and development of the Book of the Dead has been given, and to illustrate the paleography of the different recessions, from about B.C. 3500 to about A.D. 200, eighteen plates have been appended. The remaining brief accounts of some of the religious views of the Egyptians are necessary for the understanding of the aim and object of the Book of the Dead. They would have been fuller, had space permitted and I reserve a more detailed description of them for a further work on the Egyptian religion. With the view of showing how, in the Ptolemaic period and later times, the Egyptians hoped to obtain for their dead all the benefits which were believed to be secured for them by the use of the numerous chapters of earlier periods, by means of a work which, though extremely short, preserved all the essential beliefs of an olden time, a translation has been added of the Book of Breathings, from the text of the papyrus of Karashur, British Museum number 9995. By means of this, in the extracts from the pyramid texts given in my chapter on the Elysian Fields, a comparison of the beliefs of the Egyptians in the earliest and latest times can be made. In a small volume accompanying the text of the Theban Recession will be found a vocabulary containing over 35,000 references, which has been bound up separately and difference to the wishes of many. In the case of uncommon words, every example of its use which occurs in the book is noted. For commoner words, copious references are given in order that the reader may the more easily compare their meanings in several passages. Finally, it is my duty to express my grateful thanks to the trustees of the British Museum for permission to print certain chapters of the papyrus of Nebseni and of the papyrus of Ani from the publications issued by them. My thanks are also due to Mr. Holhausen of Vienna for the care which he has bestowed upon the printing of the three parts of this work, and to Mr. Griggs for the colored reproductions from the papyrus of Ani, which he has executed with his usual skill. E. A. Wallace Budge, London, August 19th, 1897. End of Preface Introduction of the Egyptian Book of the Dead by E. A. Wallace Budge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Introduction The History of the Book of the Dead, Part 
one long ago in the earliest period of egyptian civilization the dwellers on the nile were in the habit of preserving the dead bodies of their relatives and friends by means of salt soda resin bitumen and other substances of like nature and although the art of mummifying and swathing the body in linen bandages did not attain to its highest pitch of perfection until several hundreds of years later the simple means which were employed in the earliest days were effectual in keeping bones sinews and skin in existence upon earth the egyptians embalmed their dead either because they wished to keep their material bodies with them upon earth or because they believed that the future welfare of the departed depended in some way upon the preservation of the bodies which they had left behind them upon earth whatever the motive it is quite certain that it must have been a very powerful one for the custom of embalming the dead lasted in egypt without a break for at least five thousand years it survived all the influence which the greeks and romans brought to bear upon the habits and customs of the egyptians and only disappeared from the country about two hundred years before its conquest by muhammad's general amir ibn al assi a d six hundred and fifty eight the writings of ancient egypt show that it was not only the custom but also the duty of a man to prepare during his lifetime a suitable tomb in which his body might rest after death and it is to the desire of preserving the body on the part of the egyptians which found practical expression in the hewing of tombs and the making of elaborate funeral furniture that we owe the greater part of our knowledge of their religious beliefs as time went on the embalming of the dead was performed in a more elaborate manner and at the same time the last resting-place of the mummified body was chosen more carefully and wrought with greater attention at a very early period the wealthy discarded the use of holes in rocks and caves as tombs for in these the bodies were accessible to the attacks of enemies and wild animals and serpents and the same objection was naturally made to shallow hollows made in the limestone and covered over with slabs of the same material and also to the vaulted crude brick graves which were commonly in use in the early dynasties the place of these was taken by pyramids built of stone and by many chambered tombs hewn in the living rock experience however soon showed the egyptian that the most carefully constructed tomb was incapable of preventing damp rot or dry rot and decay and that some other power besides his own must be invoked to prevent the destruction of the body which though needing longer time to accomplish was as effectually performed by these means as by the tooth of the wild animal or serpent or by the hand of the enemy at this stage the aid of the professional religious man or priest was called in and the task of finding means to prevent rot and decay was entrusted to him there is little doubt that when the body was laid to rest in the tomb the priest pronounced certain words or formulae or prayers over it and it is probable that the recital of these words was accompanied by the performance of certain ceremonies whatever these formulae were they formed the foundation of the book of the dead of later egyptian times it is idle to attempt to consider what such words were but we are within our right if we assume that they were addressed to the god or gods of the community on behalf of the dead and that they contained petitions for the welfare of the departed in the world beyond the grave such petitions would refer more to material than to spiritual happiness indeed it is more than doubtful if the egyptian at that time had developed any spiritual conceptions in our sense of the word for although his ideas were very definite as to the reality of a future existence i think that he had formulated few details about it and that he had no idea as to where or how it was to be enjoyed certain portions of texts which have been incorporated into religious works of a later period show that the life which the egyptian hoped to live after death was one similar to that which he led upon earth and it is clear that he thought the preservation of his natural or material body to be in some way absolutely necessary for the attainment of this life he hoped to have power to exercise all the natural functions of his body and to be able to journey about at pleasure 
unless the body and all its members were preserved such a life was impossible for him the earliest monuments in egypt of the historic period are tombs and the universal testimony of these is to the effect that the egyptian endeavoured to attain to this life by the embalmment of the body and by the power which the texts inscribed upon his tomb coffin etc could give him and this was always so for the earliest tombs proved that they were hewn out or built according to a recognised system which had become sanctified by antiquity and that they were intended to keep intact bodies which had been treated with balms and balsams unguents and drugs and other similar preservative compounds and the texts written upon them take the fact of the existence of a future life for granted and assume that its duration will be infinite the oldest tombs of this kind to which we can assign a date belong to the period of the second dynasty about b c four thousand two hundred but there are some in existence which are remarkable for the extremely archaic grouping of the inscriptions upon the walls and which may well belong to a very much earlier time in this connection the evidence supplied by the curious tombs which m m amelino and j de morgan have recently excavated at el amra a place situated about five miles from abydos on the west bank of the nile is of peculiar interest here were found a number of oval graves sunk in the stony soil to a depth varying from five to six feet wherein were the skeletons of human bodies lying upon their sides their hands were crossed before their faces and their knees were bent and were on a level with their chests with them were buried flints small bronze implements pottery ornamented and plain stone vases shell ornaments etc and though experts are divided in their opinion as to the exact antiquity of these objects there seems little doubt that the oldest of them belonged to the period of the dawn of egyptian civilization and that is sufficient for our purpose at present a number of the skeletons from the tombs of el amra were submitted for examination to dr fouquet of cairo who has found reason for declaring that they show traces of the bodies to which they belonged having been treated with compounds or substances used in embalming the dead this fact shows that the friends and relatives of the departed who caused their bodies to be so treated must have considered that it would be of some benefit to them in their life in the world beyond the grave and in so doing they were probably only conforming to a custom which was already old and well established in their day it must not be forgotten that the skeletons in the cemetery of el amra were found lying on their sides and this fact strongly supports the view that the tombs are not tombs of egyptians but of their immediate predecessors or of contemporaries of the early dynasties in no egyptian tomb hitherto opened has the mummy been deposited on its side moreover the egyptian mummy is always found lying upon its back its arms are always laid on the body and the hands rest on the tops of the thighs though the burials at el amra tell us nothing about the ceremonies religious or otherwise which were performed over the departed when they were committed to the earth they prove almost beyond a doubt that peoples older than the egyptians partially embalmed their dead at that remote period and this being so it is probable that the religious ideas and the belief in the future life which the egyptians possessed were shared by the nations round about them with whom they were perhaps connected by ties of blood passing from prehistoric times of which we know little and that little imperfectly we come to the tombs of the first four dynasties which show that a great development in the religious ideas and funeral ceremonies has taken place since the first of the graves at el amra was dug we see that certain symbolic ceremonies were regularly performed that a number of priestly officials with clearly defined duties in connection with funerals had come into being that a large number of festivals were celebrated at or near the tomb throughout the year that the offering of meat and drink of unguents and garments and of green herbs and flowers at stated times had grown into a system that a number of gods were duly honoured and worshipped 
that the priests of the gods belonged to and probably formed the ruling class of the districts in which they lived that certain gods had already obtained the position of national deities who were known and honoured throughout the country and that certain cities such as abydos anu on and memphis had become centres of teaching of the views and dogmas which their respective priests had adopted and modified or had themselves evolved it is quite certain that certain priestly officials lived and died for the texts on their tombs bear witness to this fact if the official lived then the office to which he was appointed existed and if religious books the reading of which during the funeral was necessary for the welfare of the departed had not existed men would not have been appointed to read them at this time we find that certain priests called priests of the ka were duly appointed and that they performed their ministrations in chapels of the ka which were attached to the tombs of kings and wealthy men this shows beyond a doubt that the doctrine of the existence of a double of a man had been evolved and the making of offerings to it at stated intervals at the tomb proves that it was believed to dwell therein and that material meat and drink were necessary for its well-being this is important also as indicating that the offerings were not consumed by the deceased himself however needful the ceremony of offering them might be for his general welfare similarly the sufferings death and resurrection of osiris were well known in the period of the early dynasties and it is probable that he became the type of the resurrection of man in egypt long before the religious texts which assume it and which call him the god and king and judge of the dead passed from oral tradition to inscribed papyrus a study of the religious texts of all periods proves that the great fundamental religious ideas of the egyptians remained unchanged from the earliest to the latest historical times and it seems that they must have been received by the early egyptian priests in much the same form as that in which they handed them on the doctrine of immortality and everlasting life and the belief in the resurrection of a spiritual body are the brightest and most prominent features of the egyptian religion they survived all the theological theories and speculations of the various schools of religious thought in egypt and to them generations of men clung with a firmness and tenacity marvellous to consider and side by side with these beliefs there flourished the religious texts to which the name book of the dead has been given and they appealed mightily to all from highest to lowest for they were believed to give man power in the world beyond the grave and to enable him to attain to the abode of the blessed and to gain everlasting life no amount of research and no discovery have as yet yielded any information about the home and origin and early history of the book of the dead it seems pretty clear that as said above the first form of all of the book of the dead consisted of the words or petitions addressed to the god of the city or to a collection of supernatural powers on behalf of the deceased by relatives and friends and that such petitions referred to material rather than to spiritual things that they would increase in number and in length as time went on is only what is to be expected and the nature of their contents also would vary according to the rank and position of the deceased at first they were recited only and not written down and it is probable that they existed in this form for a very long period at length they were done in to writing but this i believe only took place when the professional religious men or priests began to be doubtful about the meaning of some of them and uncertain about the way in which they should be written the priests wrote them down to preserve them and thus endeavoured to keep without further corruption texts which already in their day had become exceedingly old and difficult of understanding the writing materials which they employed for this purpose are unknown it is hardly possible that they inscribed their texts upon stone for had they done so remains of such inscriptions would certainly have been found ere this in egypt at all events the commonest writing material was the papyrus and the hieroglyphic for book or writing being in the earliest times a roll of papyrus tied round the middle with a string of the same material it is probable that religious texts were first written upon papyrus rolls 
the syllabary or alphabet or both employed by these early scribes would probably be hieroglyphic or pictorial but no specimen of it has come down to us it is not likely that the signs used for writing the texts would be wholly alphabetic or wholly syllabic for in the earliest inscriptions known to us both kinds are used where and by whom the texts of the book of the dead were composed is also unknown there is no good reason for assuming that they are the offspring of the minds of libyans or dwellers of central africa they cannot be the literary product of savages or negroes there is no evidence to show that they are of semitic origin and the general testimony of their contents indicates an asiatic home for their birthplace certain of the ideas expressed in the earliest form of the book of the dead known to us are gross and brutal but they were retained rather by the conservative spirit of the egyptians than by any belief in them their reverence of our ancient writings and customs is too well known to need comment here that such texts should suffer modification as time went on is only to be expected but we may be sure that the original purpose of them remained unchanged and that all really essential ideas and beliefs of a fundamental character found expression always in the same way wherever its original home may have been or whatever was its origin or whoever were its authors it is quite certain that the book of the dead in a connected form is as old as egyptian civilization and that its sources belong to prehistoric times to which it is impossible to assign a date we first touch solid ground in the history of the book of the dead in the period of the early dynasties and if we accept one tradition which was current in egypt as early as b c two thousand five hundred we are right in believing that certain parts of it are in their present form as old as the time of the first dynasty the sixty fourth chapter which is admitted on all hands to be exceedingly old exists in two versions the rubric to one of these declares that the chapter is as old as the time of hesepti the fifth king of the first dynasty about b c four thousand two hundred and sixty six and says that it was found beneath the henu boat by the foreman of the builders and the rubric to the other states that it was found at hermopolis inscribed upon a block of ironstone by harutataf the son of khufu or cheops the second king of the fourth dynasty about b c three thousand seven hundred and thirty three when he was inspecting the temples throughout the country these opinions find expression upon coffins of the eleventh and twelfth dynasties and in papyri of the best period that is to say from about b c one thousand six hundred to b c one thousand and though one makes out the chapter to be some six hundred years older than the other both agree in assigning to it a date which is coeval with the early empire it is difficult to note what is exactly meant by the word found it may of course mean that a stone slab bearing the text of the chapter was discovered while certain repairs or alterations were being carried out in the temple of the god thoth at hermopolis or it may mean that the chapter was edited in some way by khufu's son haruptataf the latter explanation is certainly the more probable for we know from other sources that Harup tataf was a learned man and that he was the author of various literary works which enjoyed a considerable reputation on the other hand the ancient custom of ascribing the works of unknown authors to famous men may have already been in vogue of the book of the dead of the second third and fourth dynasties we know nothing and no copies of any part of the recension then in use have come down to us the texts on the tombs of the priests of that period show that funeral ceremonies were performed in accordance with the instruction contained in the rubrics to the various chapters of the book of the dead and the existence of collections of religious texts stands assured during the reign of menka ra the mycerinus of the greeks the fourth king of the fourth dynasty about b c three thousand six hundred and thirty three certain chapters that is thirty b and one hundred and forty eight are said to have been found by harutataf and there are traditions extant that religious ceremonies were performed with renewed vigour during the reign of this king on the coffin of men Kau ra are inscribed two lines of text which are also found on the walls inside the pyramids of tata and pepi 
the first kings of the sixth dynasty it would be absurd to suppose that these lines formed the only portion of the text known in the fourth dynasty and thus we are entitled to assume that the same recension of the book of the dead which was known and copied in the sixth dynasty was also known and copied in the fourth dynasty from the lines on the coffin of men ra we learn some interesting facts namely that the dead king was identified with the god that the divine origin of the god was ascribed also to the king that the life of the king in the world beyond the grave was to be that of a god that all his foes were to be vanquished and that he was to become a being possessed of life everlasting here then is a proof of the acceptance of the osiris story and of the doctrine of immortality or everlasting life at a very remote period in egypt during the period of the fifth and sixth dynasties a remarkable development took place in the funeral ceremonies performed for egyptian kings the kings of the fourth dynasty khufu cheops ka f ra kephren and men ka ra had built for their tombs the stone pyramids at giza which to this day excite the wonder and admiration of the civilized world but the walls of the chambers and corridors are uninscribed and they tell us nothing of the texts which were recited during the funeral and nothing of the ceremonies by which they were accompanied at the close of the fifth dynasty however eunice the king b c three thousand three hundred and thirty three built as his tomb a stone pyramid at a place now called saqqara which is situated on the west bank of the nile a few miles to the south of the modern city of cairo and he covered the greater parts of the walls of the chambers corridors etc with several hundred vertical lines of hieroglyphic text which were deeply cut and filled up with green paint or composition in the year eighteen eighty one monsieur maspero effected an entrance into this pyramid and he recognized at once the fact that the inscriptions which he saw before him formed the text of the book of the dead which was in use in egypt during the period of the fifth dynasty continuing his labors in this pyramid field he opened the pyramids of teta pepi the first meren ra and pepi the second kings of the sixth dynasty who reigned from about b c three thousand three hundred to b c three thousand one hundred and sixty six and he found that the texts which covered the walls inside were duplicates with additions of those which he had already found in the pyramid of eunice we thus see for the first time a collected series of texts of the book of the dead in the earliest recension known to us this recension may for convenience be called the heliopolitan because it bears unmistakable evidence that it was drawn up by the priests of anu on or heliopolis and that it contains the peculiar views held by the priests of the colleges of that very ancient city though five sets of extracts from it have come down to us in a tolerably complete state of preservation we must not assume that they represent all the texts which belong to it indeed the various sections of it which were copied upon funeral monuments and papyri in later times indicate that for all practical purposes its extent was illimitable how much editing was done to the texts of this recension by the priests of anu cannot be said but there is considerable evidence scattered throughout it which shows that they had been edited two or three times before and it is clear that we have preserved in it many religious ideas and beliefs which belong to what may be termed strata of religious thought of different periods and dates some of them certainly go back to a period in the history of the egyptians when they celebrated their triumphs over their enemies in a brutal and savage fashion and others belong to a time when their ancestors stood but little higher on the ladder of civilization than the barbarous tribes who lived on their western and southern frontiers the heliopolitan recension of the book of the dead consists of a series of paragraphs each of which is introduced by the word recite scattered throughout the text are directions to the priests who performed the ceremonies when to make certain presentations of meat drink and other objects in later days the rubrical directions were written at the ends of the sections and titles were given to the sections which henceforth became special chapters intended to produce certain definite results an excellent idea of the arrangement 
of the text in the pyramids will be obtained from the accompanying page of hieroglyphic extract which is taken from the text written for eunice one four hundred and ninety six following at the end of the sixth dynasty the walls of the chambers of tombs built for great and wealthy men were profusely ornamented with texts and scenes both coloured and uncoloured but in none do we find religious texts belonging to the collection which the royal pyramids have revealed to us it is difficult to account for this except on the score of economy the wealthy man or owner of large estates caused the scenes which showed his greatness and affluence to be vividly depicted on the walls of his tomb but even in the east where time has always been of little value and labour cheap the difference between the cost of cutting several hundred lines of hieroglyphics in limestone and filling them up with paint and the cost of painting a number of agricultural and other scenes in tempera must have been very considerable in the former case the text had to be set out by the artist and then carefully cut by the skilled mason and it must not be forgotten that the copy from which the artist worked may have been in hieratic or cursive characters in which case the difficulties of the work would be increased in the latter the artist's work was limited to broad outline which could be quickly drawn and the filling in of the colours was an easy matter during the interval between the end of the sixth dynasty and the beginning of the eleventh we know nothing of the fortunes of the book of the dead and it is not until we come to the middle or end of the eleventh dynasty that we find other copies of the work of the history too of the period of the seventh eighth ninth and tenth dynasties very little is known and though in certain districts in upper egypt tombs of considerable size and beauty were built yet no striking development in the funeral text seems to have taken place or if it did we have no record of it belonging to the eleventh and twelfth dynasties however we have a number of coffins of considerable importance for the study of the book of the dead they may be roughly divided into three classes one those which are painted to represent funeral chambers or tombs two those which are almost plain outside but covered inside with text in the hieratic or cursive egyptian character and three those which are inscribed both inside and out the texts are usually traced in black upon the plain surface of the wood the chief inscriptions which record the name and titles of the deceased being painted in large hieroglyphics either in a vertical line down the length of the cover or in a horizontal line round the upper part of the four sides of the coffin on the right hand side at the foot is often painted or inlaid the double achat or so-called symbolic eyes plates one and two illustrate as far as possible without the use of colours the arrangement of the text on such coffins the scene in plate one is from one end inside of the famous coffin of amamu the border with its pattern of rectangles is painted in bright colours red green and yellow and all round the upper part of the sides are painted the principal objects which form the usual offerings to the dead and a prayer that the deceased may have such things offered in his tomb for ever here we see vases and jars of various shapes and sizes filled with unguents and cosmetics the names of which are given in the line of hieroglyphics above them they are set upon a stand broken examples of which have been from time to time found in tombs each of the vertical lines of text begins with the word recite a fact which shows that the text was usually inscribed upon the walls of tombs plate two gives an extract from the text inscribed upon the coffin of sebek ah preserved at berlin it will be noticed that the hieroglyphics have begun to assume a conventional form and that they do not so readily suggest the objects which they represent we notice too that the various sections on such coffins have specific titles attached to them in other words they have become chapters as the pyramids of the fifth and sixth dynasties do not all contain the same selection of extracts from the book of the dead so the coffins of the eleventh and twelfth dynasties do not all contain the same selection of chapters this fact shows that the selection of the extracts and chapters did not follow any general rule but whether it depended upon the will and discretion of the scribe or the deceased cannot be said down the length of the bottom of the coffin inside was frequently painted a band of white across which were traced in blue wavy lines to indicate water this probably represented the celestial nile or the stream upon which the deceased hoped to float to the elysian fields 
we must note in passing that at the period when these coffins were made no pyramids were inscribed with extracts or chapters from the book of the dead in other words it was found both cheaper and easier to write the text with ink or colours upon planks which could be afterwards pegged together to form coffins this custom resulted in the curtailment of the selection of texts and in less than a thousand years after the religious texts in the pyramids of the fifth and sixth dynasties were cut we find that certain portions of them had fallen into disuse we have already seen that a period lies between the sixth and eleventh dynasties during which we know nothing of the book of the dead and again during the period which lies between the twelfth and eighteenth dynasties we know nothing of it with the beginning of the eighteenth dynasty the book of the dead begins a new phase of its existence and a development of its history as interesting as it is unexpected is before us from pyramids the transition was to coffins and now the transition is from coffins to papyri and here again economy probably played an important part inscribed pyramids and sarcophagi and coffins would necessarily be only made for royal personages and for great and wealthy folk but a roll of papyrus was in comparison with these a very inexpensive thing especially if the surfaces of an ordinary scribe were employed in inscribing it end of introduction the history of the book of the dead part one introduction part two of the egyptian book of the dead by e a wallace budge this librivox recording is in the public domain introduction the history of the book of the dead part two the greater number of the copies of the book of the dead inscribed upon papyri have been found at thebes indeed those made in this city are of such importance that to the recension of the work which we commonly find in use in egypt from the eighteenth to the twenty-second dynasty the name theban has been given we owe them chiefly to the scribes and priests who were attached to the powerful confraternity of the priests of amen ra the king of the gods and speaking generally the best manuscripts are found in their tombs and coffins their original home of the text which they copied was of course memphis or heliopolis and there is reason for believing that during the earlier centuries of their existence they did little more than adopt the religious views and doctrines of the sages of the north as time went on and the worshippers of amen obtained greater power this god was slowly but surely made to usurp the attributes of the older cosmic gods of egypt and eventually as we see in chapter one hundred and seventy one his name is included among those of the old gods of the book of the dead the papyri inscribed with copies of the theban recension of the book of the dead vary in length from about fifteen to ninety feet and in width from twelve to eighteen inches in many cases the various pieces which form the papyrus are so carefully put together that it is almost impossible to see where one piece ends and the other begins in the early part of the eighteenth dynasty the text is always written with black ink in vertical columns of hieroglyphics which are separated from each other by black lines the titles of the chapters and the initial word or words of certain parts of the chapters and catchwords and rubrics are written with red ink in the eighteenth dynasty or perhaps a little earlier the scribes began to ornament the papyri with designs in black outline referring to the subject matter of the text near which they were placed such designs or vignettes as they are usually called occupy quite a subordinate position and they were drawn most probably by the scribe little by little however they increased in number and it became the fashion to illuminate them with bright colours greens reds yellows in the nineteenth dynasty the unilluminated papyrus became the exception and the vignettes flourished at the expense of the text 
an idea of the beauty of a fully coloured papyrus of the best period may be gained from the frontispiece to this volume and from the plates which face pages nineteen and one hundred and seventy and plates three through eight will illustrate the characteristics of good manuscripts of the eighteenth and nineteenth dynasties except as to colour plate three illustrates the writing and vignettes of the famous papyrus of nebseni which was found at memphis it measures seventy-seven feet seven and a half inches by one foot one and a half inch and contains seventy-seven chapters not including duplicates and triplicates the vignettes are traced in outline and are remarkably well drawn and both vignettes and text appear to be the work of one scribe probably nebseni himself the papyrus of nebseni was apparently written early in the eighteenth dynasty plate four contains a vignette and a piece of text from the papyrus of nu which was found at thebes it measures sixty-five feet three and a half inches by one foot one and a half inch and contains one hundred and thirty-one chapters though shorter than the papyrus of nebseni the texts inscribed on it are more numerous for the writing is smaller and the lines are closer together some of the chapters have vignettes but they occupy an entirely subordinate position and the colouring is not as fine as that found in documents of a later date the date of this papyrus cannot be much later than that of nebseni on plate five we have an example of the very fine bold writing which is found in the papyrus of ani which was found at thebes this document measures seventy-eight feet by one foot three inches and contains sixty-six chapters it is the finest of all the illuminated papyri of the eighteenth dynasty and from an artistic point of view its value is greater than that of any other papyrus it is made up of six distinct lengths of papyrus which have been neatly joined the text was written by several scribes and the vignettes are the work of more than one artist an examination of the document shows that the artist's work was done before the text was written at times the space needed for the text was miscalculated and the scribe was compelled to reduce the size of his writing and even to write words on the coloured border within which text and vignettes are enclosed the first sixteen feet of the papyrus were inscribed probably by ani himself the other sections were written by scribes of the same school probably after his death the hymn to osiris on plate six is probably in ani's own handwriting and the characters are formed with an attention to detail not often found elsewhere the vignettes and text on plate seven show the work of two scribes and two artists and also show that the inscribed portion of one section was done on a larger scale than was contemplated in the earlier sections here we see that the borders had to be enlarged to make the join from this we see too that the planning of a papyrus was a matter which was left to the discretion of the artist and scribe and when we consider that the papyrus of nebseni contains duplicates and even triplicates of some chapters and that the papyrus of ani contains two copies of chapter eighteen one with an introduction and one without slightly differing from each other and having the sections of the vignette arranged differently it is clear that even the best scribes did not tie themselves to any one plan or method in preparing a copy of the book of the dead we may note too that in the papyrus of ani a large section of the text of chapter seventeen has been omitted by the scribe probably because the artist had not left sufficient space for the whole chapter in the text moreover several palpable errors occur but on the other hand we have in the vignettes descriptions of mythological scenes names of gods etc which occur in no other text among these worthy of special mention are the judgment scene and the accompanying texts and the vignette to the seventeenth chapter plate eight gives us a vignette and a few lines of text from the papyrus of hugh nefer a scribe and superintendent of cattle who flourished in the reign of seti the first about b c thirteen hundred and seventy the cartouche of the king affords conclusive proof as to its date 
this document is remarkable from many points of view it is the shortest perfect manuscript of his class known measuring eighteen feet by one foot three and three eighths inches the vignettes are beautiful specimens of the artist's work and the scene in which the performance of the ceremony of opening the mouth is depicted perfect is the most perfect known but the vignette to chapter seventeen is imperfect when compared with that of the papyrus of ani the copy of chapter one is so good that m naville employed it as the standard text in his Tadten book but the copy of chapter seventeen is so incomplete and incorrect that he found it useless even for purposes of comparison here again we see that the vignettes were executed at the expense of the text in spite of this however the papyrus is valuable for it contains a hymn to osiris by the god thoth which is not found elsewhere in the same form the text is written in a good bold hand but with little attention to the details of the characters and the judgment scene exhibits many peculiarities both in respect of text and arrangement plates nine and ten illustrate the vignettes and the hieratic and hieroglyphic texts which are found in books of the dead of the twentieth dynasty in plate nine we see the royal mother netshemet standing behind her son herheru the dress and ornaments of these royal personages show the change which has taken place in such matters since the eighteenth and nineteenth dynasties and in the manner of depicting them the colours of the vignettes are more crude the delicacy of design and of execution alike has departed and a comparison of the text with that of the papyrus of nu shows that the skill of the scribe had deteriorated the hieratic text on plate ten gives an excellent idea of the writing of the period in the twentieth dynasty books of the dead inscribed for the priests of amen began with a vignette either plain or coloured in which the deceased was seen making offerings to osiris or to the gods of thebes this was followed by a selection of chapters from the book of the dead in use in the eighteenth dynasty or by a series of texts peculiar to the period accompanied by vignettes taken from other funeral works sometimes as in the case of the princess nessi Kansu, the document begins with a long detailed list of the titles of amen ra who by this time had usurped the attributes of the old gods of egypt which is followed by a series of statements in which the god in apparently legal language swears to confer every favour possible upon the deceased lady such documents are not very long and they are usually much narrower than books of the dead of the earlier period the mythological figures and scenes characteristic of the later documents of the priests of amen are not yet well understood for only a few have been published in entirety of papyri of the twenty first dynasty which preserve many characteristics of the earlier period may be mentioned that of anhai a priestess of amen a section of which is shown on plate eleven here we have however a work sui generis which is very instructive from many points of view the artist's work is the most valuable part of the papyrus and the use of gold for purposes of illumination appears for the first time in addition to the vignettes of the older period we find here the scene of the creation given much as it is found on the sarcophagus of seti i and a rare vignette which seems to refer to kemenu the city of thoth the texts are fragmentary and often have no connection with the vignettes which accompany them but many of the vignettes are of considerable interest the handwriting is in some places very good but it lacks the bold firmness which is characteristic of the older scribes in papyri of the eighteenth dynasty we find many mistakes but most of them may be attributed to momentary carelessness on the part of a weary scribe whereas in those of the twenty-first and succeeding dynasties the writers of the texts seem to be altogether reckless texts are copied beginning at the end instead of at the beginning omissions of whole sections are frequent texts that have proper vignettes are copied without the least regard to the correct vignettes 
and what is intended to be a chapter frequently consists of nothing but a series of fragments of sentences copied without break merely to fill up the space which the artist had spared for the purpose it seems as if the artist both painted the vignettes and wrote the text and as if his sole aim was to produce a handsome but not accurate document the contents of the papyri reflect no doubt the religious views commonly held at that period and if this be so it is clear that the priests of amen held the texts which they inserted alongside of the chapters of the older period to be of equal value and authority some of them went so far as to fill their papyri with religious compositions which are never to be found in the old works in plate twelve we have a vignette with a few lines of text from the papyrus which i believe was written in the twenty-second dynasty the artist's work is a copy or rather a very poor imitation of the illuminating of the nineteenth dynasty and the text consists of a series of compositions referring to the offerings which were to be made to the gods of the querti or divisions of the underworld strictly speaking these have nothing whatever to do with the book of the dead but in the opinion of the scribe they were equally efficacious in the same dynasty a large number of copies of selections of chapters from the book of the dead were written in hieratic with vignettes traced in outline in black ink in some of these the papyrus measures about forty feet by one foot six inches and in others the dimensions are considerably less an idea of the appearance of such papyri may be gained from plate thirteen which illustrates both the fine drawing and small but clear hieratic writing of the period it is probable that the books of the dead written in hieratic during the twentieth twenty-first and twenty-second dynasties belong to a recension different in many respects from the theban but that such recension is akin to the theban there is no doubt whatever in both the chapters have no fixed order and in both the chapters have special titles a characteristic which distinguishes them from the sections of the books of the dead of the fifth sixth eleventh and twelfth dynasties it is tolerably easy to identify the papyri which were inscribed before b c nine hundred in fact as long as the power of the priests of amen was paramount at thebes the copies of the books of the dead which were inscribed for them reflect the prosperity of the confraternity but when it became necessary for the priests to hide at deir el bahari the mummies of the kings and queens who had been their greatest benefactors and troublous times came upon them everything relating to the rites and ceremonies connected with the dead suffered and the relatives and friends of the dead were obliged to do for them not what they would but what they could eventually it would seem a time came when no books of the dead were written and this period corresponds i believe to the final failure of the domination of the priests of amen this is not the place to lament the mistake which the priests of amen made when they tried to rule egypt temporally as well as spiritually or to regret the policy which made them exalt their god amen above the older gods of the country whom the people had known and worshipped from time immemorial it is sufficient to know that in each matter they failed they lost their own temporal power as the result of their intrigues and at best they only succeeded in obtaining for their god a place side by side with the old gods it must however not be forgotten that we owe some of the best and finest copies of the book of the dead to scribes who had married priestesses of amen and who were themselves attached to the brotherhood with the rise of the kings of the twenty sixth dynasty to power the book of the dead enters upon a new lease of life and a general revival of ancient religious customs took place the temples were repaired ancient and long forgotten texts were recopied and artists and sculptors took their models from the best works of the masters of the early empire early in this dynasty it appears the priesthood which succeeded the priests of amen awoke to the consciousness of the fact that the texts of the book of the dead needed re-editing and rearranging and they set to work to try to put some system into them how and when exactly the work was done we know not but it is probable 
that it was carried out by an assembly or college of priests we have seen above that scribes tied themselves to no one plan in making their copies of the book of the dead and that the work of the artist on the vignettes which were subordinate matters originally was at times allowed to drive the text from the papyrus in the best papyri too the selection of texts copied is never the same and the order of them is never the same in fact each papyrus had a plan of its own these things the priests of the twenty sixth dynasty tried to correct and the result of their labours was a recension of the book of the dead which is usually called the saite a number of papyri are extant which are inscribed therewith and an examination of them shows that the chapters follow a certain order and that although the papyri vary in length the selection of chapters being not as full in some of them as in others this order has few exceptions each of the early recensions of the book of the dead known to us exhibits peculiarities which reflect the religious views of the time when it was written and the saita recension is not an exception to the rule for included in it are four chapters one hundred and sixty two to one hundred and sixty five which have no counterparts in the papyri of the older period they are remarkable also for containing a number of foreign words it has been suggested that these chapters are of nubian origin and if so it would be interesting to know the circumstances under which they were inserted in the book of the dead it is difficult to identify with certainty the papyri which were actually written during the twenty sixth dynasty but manuscripts written in the period immediately preceding the ptolemaic are not difficult to recognize plate fourteen gives fourteen lines of text and part of a vignette from a document of this class and shows what a well-defined class it is the text is written with black ink in vertical columns of spidery hieroglyphics separated by black lines and the vignettes occupy small spaces above it the vignettes of the sunrise or sunset the judgment scene and the elysian fields occupy the whole length of the papyrus sometimes the vignettes are all mixed together but even when coloured they lack the artistic appearance and good work of the illuminated papyri of the eighteenth nineteenth and twentieth dynasties the recension in use in the ptolemaic period is well illustrated by plate fifteen which is reproduced from lepsius edition of the turin papyrus this papyrus is probably the best and longest manuscript of the class known the selection of chapters is remarkably full the number of chapters however is not one hundred and sixty five but one hundred and fifty three for three of them chapters sixteen one hundred and forty three and one hundred and fifty are in reality vignettes and nine others chapters forty eight forty nine seventy three one hundred and seven one hundred and eleven one hundred and twenty one hundred and twenty one one hundred and twenty nine and one hundred and thirty nine are duplicates of chapters found in other parts of the papyrus the titles of the chapters catchwords parts of rubrics etc are written in red meanwhile however a number of short religious works for funeral use had been composed presumably by the priests and it seems that towards the end of the ptolemaic period it was more usual to inscribe these upon papyri than the chapters of the old recensions of the book of the dead it seems as if an attempt was made to extract only the essential portions of the old works and to omit from the shortened new text the chapters which referred to faiths which were dead and to beliefs which had little or no influence in those modern times added to this the knowledge of such matters must have disappeared from the community long before the ptolemies ruled the land and though the belief in the resurrection of the spiritual body and in life everlasting beyond the grave retained its power over the people as firmly as ever most men had no knowledge whatever of the texts which their forefathers who were dead and gone imagined to be necessary for the attainment of the same the sepulchral stelae and coffins show that neither the employer nor the employed had an exact idea of the import of the texts and symbols which were cut or painted upon them 
and to ignorance as much as to haste must be attributed the blunders which occur in funeral texts of this period here and there we find an attempt to preserve vignettes and texts of the old period along with the modern work and a good example of this class of document is the papyrus of karasher a portion of which is reproduced on plate sixteen here we have a representation of the judgment scene crude alike in colour and detail a part of the vignette of the first chapter of the old book of the dead a number of the pylons discussed in chapters one hundred and forty five and one hundred and forty six etc and two horizontal lines of hieroglyphics which contain prayers reflecting those of an earlier period no manuscript could more clearly show how little knowledge of the old book of the dead remained in the hands of the scribes at that time artistic skill moreover had sunk very low for it will be noticed that the censer which the white-skirted priest is carrying before the bier and which he was supposed to carry in his hand is almost as long as he is high the coloured portion of this papyrus is followed by three columns of text in hieratic which formed the work entitled shai on sensum or book of breathings wherein we find no hymns and no addresses to the gods and in fact no words which do not directly refer to the future life of the deceased in the world beyond the grave here we have an epitome of all that the egyptian hoped to obtain in the land of eternity we have now reached the end of the graeco roman period but the end of the book of the dead is not yet for belonging to the roman period we find a number of small rolls of papyri inscribed in very cursive hieratic with a series of statements or assertions referring to the happiness of the deceased in the next world such papyri have no vignettes and as for the texts both hymns and chapters of the old book of the dead in any recension are as absent from them as if they had never existed the aim of the writer of such documents was not to glorify the gods but to secure the goods of the next world by means of the smallest amount of writing possible and at the least expense on plate eighteen it reproduced a portion of a papyrus of this class and a comparison of it with the earlier plates in this book will show at once the change which had come over the book of the dead what form the book of the dead took in the early centuries of the christian era cannot be said but it seems not to have died out utterly for selections from it are found copied upon the outer and inner swathings of mummies and upon coffins of the roman period on a coffin in paris which was probably made about the end of the second century of our era are written a number of texts which are as old as the time of the pyramids at saqqara and this fact proves that when such documents were needed originals from which to copy them could always be found there is good reason for assuming that the art of making mummies was practised until the end of the fifth century of our era and there is no doubt that in certain places the belief that the preservation of the natural body was absolutely necessary for the growth development and existence of the spiritual body existed in full force until a much later date it is not possible to assign a date to the period when the decay of the book of the dead began but it is probably contemporary with the advent of the greeks in egypt up to that period egypt may be described as the home of a nation that was given up entirely to the care of the dead and to the consideration of the future life a few of its kings were soldiers in the true sense of the word but it is a striking fact that the temples and tombs of egypt are the chief monuments of one of the oldest and greatest civilizations of the world a tottering religion would be rudely shaken by the invasions of the country by assyrians persians greeks and others and the permanent occupation of egypt by greeks and romans would continue the work which frequent disturbances throughout the country had begun the final blow however was not inflicted until the egyptians began to renounce their own ancient religion and to become converts of the preaching of st mark and his followers when they were once able to believe that christ had the power to raise up their bodies in a spiritual form they felt that there was no need to have them mummified and simultaneously the need for the chapters of the book of the dead disappeared we are now able to summarize the various forms of the book of the dead as follows 
it first existed in oral tradition only and was next written down to preserve it of these forms nothing whatever is known the first historical recension was that made by the priest of heliopolis and the oldest copies of it known are cut in hieroglyphics upon the walls of the chambers and passages inside the pyramids of saqqara of the fifth and sixth dynasties the second recension was written or painted upon sarcophagi and coffins of the eleventh and twelfth dynasties in cursive hieroglyphics the third recension was written in hieroglyphics upon papyri from the eighteenth to the twentieth dynasty the various chapters having no fixed order this recension was illustrated by a large number of vignettes the fourth recension was written in hieratic upon papyri during the twenty-first and twenty-second dynasties and included extracts from various funeral books which were illustrated by vignettes of an unusual character the fifth or saite recension was made probably in the twenty-sixth dynasty the chapters have a fixed order and were written on papyri both in hieratic and hieroglyphics the sixth recension which was in use in ptolemaic times much resembled the saite and may be regarded as the last form of the book of the dead for the extracts from it written for the benefit of the dead upon small pieces of papyri in the graeco roman and roman periods need hardly be considered thus the great religious work of the egyptians which had lasted for thousands of years and which in early times cut in fine bold hieroglyphics covered the walls and passages of the tombs of kings ended its existence in almost illegible scrawls hastily traced upon scraps of papyrus only a few inches square from first to last throughout the book of the dead with the single exception of herutataf the second son of cheops no man is mentioned as the author or reviser of any chapter or of any part of it certain chapters may show the influence of the cult of a certain city or cities but the theban book of the dead at all events cannot be regarded as the work of any one man or body of men and it does not represent the religious views and beliefs of any one part only of egypt from time immemorial the god thoth who was both the divine intelligence which at creation uttered the words that were carried into effect by ptah and Kenimu, and the scribe of the gods was associated with the production of the book of the dead and though he was primarily the god of time and chronologer of heaven and earth he appears frequently as the advocate and helper of the deceased in the one hundred and eighty-second chapter he is called the scribe of right and truth who abominateth sin and again behold he is the writing reed of the god nebercher the lord of laws who giveth forth the speech of wisdom and understanding whose words have dominion over the two lands of himself the god says i am thoth the lord of right and truth who trieth the right and the truth for the gods the judge of words and their essence whose words triumph over violence i have made ra to set as osiris and osiris setteth as ra setteth the deeds which thoth claims to have done on behalf of osiris are set forth at length in the two hymns to osiris which form the one hundred and eighty second and one hundred and eighty third chapters in several places in the book of the dead the deceased is made to refer to the might of the words of the utterances of the god thoth and much of what this god did for his brother osiris was effected by this power the belief in the efficacy of the words of thoth continued till the latest period for in the book of breathings we read thoth the most mighty god the lord of kemenu cometh to thee and he writeth for thee the book of breathings with his own fingers finally mention must be made of the various places in the tomb where the papyri inscribed with the chapters of the book of the dead were placed when the egyptians ceased to cut the chapters on the walls of the chambers and passages of pyramids they wrote or painted them upon the sides inner and outer of wooden coffins and this custom obtained until the end of the rule of the native kings of egypt about b c three hundred and fifty the vignettes were copied upon coffins long after all knowledge of their meaning had been forgotten until as late as the third century of our era 
the inscribed papyrus was sometimes placed in a separate box beside the coffin and sometimes a niche in the wall was specifically cut for it the most perfect of the papyri known have been found in niches frequently the papyrus was laid by the side of the mummy in the coffin and in this case it is usually found broken by the movements of the mummy when the coffin was carried along more frequently the papyrus was laid under the hands and between the thighs before the final swathing took place it was also placed between the legs just above the ankles such papyri are usually much broken and they are often much discoloured by the moisture of the substances by tumen cedar oil etc used in the process of embalmment in the time of the greatest power of the priests of amen in the twenty first dynasty large wooden figures of osiris standing upon a pedestal were made to serve as cases for the papyri which were tightly rolled up and tied and pushed up inside the figures through holes in the bottom of the pedestals in later times about b c three hundred the figures were made solid and vertical cavities were cut in the backs of them to hold the papyri still later that is in the roman period when the papyri became very small they were laid in cavities in the sides of the pedestals which also contained mummified portions wrapped in linen of the bodies of the persons for whom they were made over the mummified remains which are placed in the upper parts of the pedestals we often find small models of sepulchral chests or coffins surmounted by figures of anubis and hawks the figure of the god above is no longer that of osiris simply but it represents the triune god ptahsekur ausar the god of the resurrection and has all the attributes which belong to the ancient gods ptah and seker in this trinity the creator of the world the sun and osiris as god of the dead were represented some think that ptah in this trinity represents the personification of the period of incubation which follows death and precedes the entry into eternal life the exact position of seeker cannot be definitely described he is usually depicted as a mummied body with the head of a hawk and he sometimes holds in his hands the emblems of power rule and sovereignty which belong to osiris he is said to be the incarnation of the apis bull at memphis End of introduction the history of the book of the dead introduction osiris and the resurrection of the egyptian book of the dead by e a wallace budge this librivox recording is in the public domain introduction osiris and resurrection it will be noticed in reading the translation of the book of the dead given in this volume that the deceased is always identified with the god osiris and that he is frequently called by the god's name and if the religious texts written for the benefit of the dead in all periods be examined it will be found that from the fifth dynasty to the latest times osiris is always regarded as the king and god of the dead and that egyptian writers always assume the identity of the blessed dead with their god thus in the text inscribed on the pyramid of unas the writer identifies the king with the god osiris and says to the god tem o tem behold thy son this motionless osiris thou hast given him that whereon he may live if he liveth this unas liveth if he dieth not this unas dieth not if he perisheth not this unas perisheth not if he begetteth not this unas begetteth not if he begetteth this unas begetteth and throughout the religious literature the deceased always claims that whatever was done by the gods for osiris should also be done for him by them the hymns addressed to ra and other great gods dwell more on the majesty and power which they exhibit in heaven and upon earth than upon their goodness to man but with osiris the case is different and it is evident that in the earliest period he was regarded more in the light of a god who could be known and who was known more or less personally if we may use the word and he was of all the gods the one singled out to receive the petitions of mankind for everlasting life 
it is impossible to say when osiris began to be regarded as the god of the dead and it is only from brief allusions that any history of him can be formed throughout the egyptian texts it is assumed that the god suffered death and mutilation at the hands of his enemies that the various members of his body were scattered about the land of egypt that his sister wife isis sought him sorrowing and at length found him that she fanned him with her wings and gave him air that she raised up his body and was united unto him that she conceived and brought forth a child horus and that he osiris became the god and king of the underworld in the legend of osiris as given by plutarch de iside et osiride it is said that he was murdered at the instigation of typhon or set who tore the body into fourteen pieces which he scattered throughout the land isis collected these pieces and wherever she found one she built a tomb after the death of osiris his son horus did battle with typhon his father's murderer and in the words of the egyptians avenged his father notwithstanding the death and mutilation which the god suffered the egyptians firmly believe that he rose from the dead with a body perfect in all its members and that corruption and decay had no power over him this fact may be deduced from a large number of passages in texts of all periods but in one in particular which forms part of chapter one hundred and fifty four of the book of the dead a definite statement of it occurs the deceased says to osiris do thou embalm these my members for i would not perish and come to an end but would be even likened to my divine father kepera who is the divine type of him that never saw corruption let not my body become worms but deliver me as thou didst deliver thyself homage to thee o my divine father osiris thou hast thy being with thy members thou didst not decay thou didst not become worms thou didst not waste away thou didst not become corruption thou didst not putrefy and thou didst not turn into worms i am the god kepera and my members shall have an everlasting experience i shall not decay i shall not rot i shall not putrefy i shall not turn into worms and i shall not see corruption beneath the eye of the god shu i shall have my being i shall have my being i shall live i shall live i shall germinate i shall germinate i shall germinate i shall wake up in peace i shall not putrefy my intestines shall not perish i shall not suffer from any defect mine eye shall not decay the form of my visage shall not disappear mine ear shall not become deaf my head shall not be separated from my neck my tongue shall not be carried away my hair shall not be cut off mine eyebrows shall not be shaved off and no baleful injury shall come upon me my body shall be stablished and it shall neither fall into decay nor be destroyed upon this earth the oldest copy of this chapter is inscribed upon one of the wrappings of the mummy of tothmes the third who reigned about b c one thousand five hundred and fifty and the latest is found in the turin papyrus edited by lepsius in eighteen forty two which dates from the ptolemaic period from these extracts we see that the deceased bases his certainty of an everlasting life which was to be lived in a body which was perfect in all its members upon the assurance that osiris died and rose again and lived in a body which was perfect in all its members and it followed for the egyptian that if osiris did not die and rise again his belief in a resurrection was vain it is difficult to say with certainty whether the ancient egyptian believed that osiris endured pain and suffered death on his behalf or not but it is quite clear that he believed there was some very definite connection between the resurrection of osiris and of himself and also that the god was able to raise him up and to give him everlasting life because he himself had conquered death and risen and had become the master of everlasting life if the legend of plutarch which states that osiris was once a man who lived upon earth really represents an egyptian belief we may perhaps 
conclude that the manhood which was common to the god and to the suppliant supplied the reason why the prayers which are put into the mouth of the dead are always addressed to osiris at all events closer personal relations existed between man and osiris than between man and any other god moreover for countless generations he was the type and emblem of the resurrection and relying upon his power to give immortality to man untold generations lived and died the ceremonies connected with the celebration of the sufferings death and resurrection of osiris were performed with great solemnity and it has been thought that a representation of them took place annually in certain of his shrines the forms in which osiris is depicted on the monuments and in papyri are very numerous but we need only refer here to those which concern him in his character as king god and judge of the dead in papyri he is seated on a throne within a covered shrine his form is that of a bearded mummy wearing the atef crown and he holds in his hands the crook and flail or whip emblems of sovereignty and dominion on the side of the throne which rests upon a pedestal made in the form of a parallelogram the symbol of that which is straight or right is the emblem of the union of southern and northern egypt which typifies the sovereignty of the god over the whole land the throne is sometimes placed upon water wherein we may probably see the origin of the tradition of certain eastern peoples which makes the throne of the deity to rest above running water behind him frequently stand the goddesses isis and nephthys and facing him standing upon a lotus flower are the four children of horus thus seated praise was offered to him in these words glory be to thee o cyrus un nefer the great god within abydos king of eternity lord of the everlasting who passeth through millions of years in his existence praise be unto thee osiris lord of eternity un nefer harmachus whose forms are manifold and whose attributes are majestic those who have lain down that is the dead rise up to see thee they breathe the air and they look upon thy face when the disk riseth on its horizon their hearts are at peace inasmuch as they behold thee o thou who art eternity and everlastingness in an address to osiris by thoth which forms the one hundred and eighty-second chapter of the book of the dead he is said to be the governor of those who are in the underworld and to make men and women to be born again the new birth being the birth into the life which is beyond the grave and being himself everlasting he had power to bestow eternal existence upon his followers concerning the form in which osiris rose from the dead the texts are silent and nothing is said as to the nature of his body in the underworld that he dwelt in the material body which was his upon earth there is no reason whatever to suppose for there are indications in the texts which point to a definite belief in the resurrection of a spiritual body both in the case of the god and of men before however this point is touched upon reference must be made to the ideas which the egyptians held concerning the component parts of man's entity material spiritual and mental the physical or material body called khat was liable to decay and could only be preserved by mummifying both gods and man possessed bodies of this nature when the material body had been brought to the tomb for burial provided that the prescribed prayers had been said over it and the proper ceremonies had been duly performed by the priests it acquired the power of sending forth from itself a body called sahu which was able to ascend to heaven and to dwell with the gods there the only suitable rendering for the word sahu is spiritual body and this meaning fits very well into the translation of the text where the word is found the educated egyptian never believed that the material body would rise again and take up a new life for he well understood that flesh and blood could not inherit immortality it has been urged by some that the custom of mummifying the dead which obtained throughout egypt for so many thousands of years was maintained because the egyptian believed in the resurrection of the material body but it is not so 
they mummified their dead simply because they believed that spiritual bodies would germinate in them in several places it is distinctly said that the soul is in heaven and the body upon earth and even the dead body of osiris himself rested upon earth in heliopolis elsewhere it is said to the deceased thy soul is in heaven before ra thy ka hath what should be given to it with the gods thy sahu hath power or is glorious with the khus and thy body kat is established in the underworld tuat it is possible that certain simple folk may have been led to believe that because meat offerings and drink offerings in abundance were taken to the tombs the deceased must naturally partake of them and it is more than probable that the egyptians in a semi-savage state made such offerings because they believed them necessary for their dead the offerings taken to the tomb were intended for the ka of the deceased the word ka has formed the subject of several learned dissertations by various scholars and it is now generally rendered by double it has its equivalent in the coptic ro and in the greek elaukon and in certain places may be rendered by all the meanings of these equivalents this abstract individuality or personality possessed all the attributes of the man himself and though its normal dwelling-place was in the tomb along with the body it could wander about at will it was independent of the man to whom it belonged and could even go and dwell in the statue of a man the ka could both eat and drink and at a very early period a small chamber was specially prepared for it in the hall of the tomb this was provided with an opening through which it might snuff the smell of the incense and other offerings made therein and it was the duty of certain members to minister duly and regularly to its needs when actual offerings failed it would seem that the ka fed upon those which were painted or sculptured upon the walls and altars in the tomb and when these were wanting it appears that it might even be reduced to eating offal and drinking filthy water connected in some inexplicable way with the ka was the ba or soul which according to some texts is said to eat of the funeral offerings along with the ka in whom or with whom it was supposed to dwell but according to others it ascended into heaven where it lived with ra and the beautiful dead from one point of view it is not a material thing and from another it is a tangible thing it is depicted as a human-headed hawk and in a vignette in the papyrus of nebket it is seen flying down the funeral pit bearing air and food to the mummified body lying in the mummy chamber to which it belongs the ba could leave its place in heaven and visit the body whenever it pleased and it had power to assume any form which it pleased certain of the characteristics of the ba were shared by the heart ab which was believed to be the source both of life and of good and evil in man the preservation of the heart was of the first importance and several chapters of the book of the dead were composed with the object of keeping it out of the clutches of the stealers of hearts in the judgment scene it is the one member of the body which is singled out for a special examination and the large numbers of heart amulets which are preserved in the national collections of egyptian antiquities testify to the anxiety which the egyptians felt as to its security with the ba or soul the kaya bit or shadow is often mentioned and it seems to have been nourished by the offerings which were made in the tomb of the man to whom it belonged it had an existence apart from the body and like the ka or double it could wander wherever it pleased an interesting passage concerning the shadow is found in the ninety-second chapter of the book of the dead where the deceased prays o keep not captive my soul o keep not ward over my shadow but let a way be opened for my soul and for my shadow and let them see the great god in the shrine on the day of the judgment of souls and let them recite the utterances of osiris whose habitations are hidden to those who guard the members of osiris and who keep ward over the khus and who hold captive the shadows of the dead who would work evil against me another integral part of a man was the 
khu or shining translucent covering of the spiritual body which dwelt in heaven with the gods it is difficult to explain its exact relationship to the double and the soul and the heart and the shadow but in certain passages in which the word occurs it seems as if it had some close connection with the soul for it is mentioned along with it in several passages both in early and late texts the sekum of a man is mentioned with the ba or soul and sometimes with both the ka or double and the ba one of the meanings of sekum is form or statue but another meaning is power and it seems as if the egyptians conceived the idea of the power or vital force of a man living with him in heaven the gods were supposed to possess doubles and souls and shadows and hearts and coups but it is doubtful if they were endowed with sekum it is probable that they were not many of them were themselves sekum or powers there remains now but one attribute of a man to mention and that is the ren or name in egypt a man took the most extraordinary precautions to prevent his name from being blotted out for it was the common belief that unless the name of a person were preserved he ceased to exist already in the pyramid texts as dr wiedemann has pointed out we find the deceased making supplication that his name may flourish literally germinate along with the names of tem shu seb and other gods and the same desire is expressed in texts from the sixth dynasty down to the roman period when we find that a number of papyri were inscribed with invocations to one or more gods with the sole object of making to flourish the names of those for whom they were copied the ren or name had some close connection with the ka or double as may be seen from the passage in the text of pepi the first thus we see that the sahu or spiritual body the ka or double the ba or soul the ab or heart the ku or shining form the sekum or vital force and the ren or name and the kai bit or shade were all believed to come into existence after death and it seems that the various parts which we have enumerated together made up the spiritual body which germinated in the cot or material body there is little doubt that the beliefs in the existence of these various members of the spiritual body are not all of the same age and they probably represent several stages of intellectual development on the part of the egyptian their origin and development it is now impossible to trace for already in the fifth and sixth dynasties their existence is accepted as an accomplished fact a question naturally arises at this point as to when this spiritual body began its existence but unfortunately no satisfactory answer can at present be given to it for no text yet discovered supplies the necessary information it is natural to suppose that the sahu or spiritual body came into being as a result of the prayers which were recited on the day of the burial of the mummified body and of the ceremonies which were performed at the same time on the other hand there exists distinct proofs that the egyptians believe in a judgment which was to be held in the domain of osiris and we should hardly expect the spiritual body to begin its career until after the trial of the heart in the balance and until the verdict of the gods at this judgment was favourable to the deceased the whole question is full of difficulty chiefly because the egyptians themselves did not i imagine form definite ideas on such subjects or if they did they did not put them in writing it is however perfectly certain that they believed that osiris had the power to make men to be born after death into a new life and that such life was everlasting and they ascribed to him this power because he had himself suffered death and mutilation and had risen from the dead end of introduction osiris and resurrection